So, when I was invited to speak here, James said, you know, if you, I don't know what you want to talk about, but if you want to talk about Scala, that would be good. <laughs> Admittedly, it was not obvious, I guess, that I would be talking about Scala. So, you know, I thought about some of the things that I could talk about. You know, I could talk about some of my interests. For example, I could talk about the history of poetry. I really like poetry. So, you know, it's an um, inspirational environment, particularly in the hotel where I'm staying, which um, has a library room, which is just amazing. It's the breakfast area and also the bar area. And there are books that you can actually take out. And, I mean, there's thousands of books, floor to ceiling all the way around. So, you know, I could have talked about the various schools of uh, poetry, such as my clicker has gone to sleep. Work well. For. Oh, it's actually. It's PowerPoint. Excuse me. It's actually frozen. I could have talked about um, some of my favorite schools of poetry, like the metaphysical school, John Donne, Andrew Marvell, perhaps um, 20th century poetry, W.B. Yeats, E.E. E. Cummings. But then I thought that to this audience, perhaps a more relevant school of poetry would have been the Pearl School. The idea of writing poetry in programming languages was first proposed in the 60s, as languages evolve to be higher level and more natural, people actually started trying in the 70s in languages like Algol. People started trying to write poems. But really the catalyst for computer language poetry to take off was Perl. Obviously you can do anything at all in Perl. But poetry was something that was specifically aimed at. So there's a number of posts in the Perl mailing lists um, where Larry Wall, um, the creator of Perl, was very explicit about certain features, saying, you know, I know this is a bit weird, but it really does help um, to write poems in Perl. So if you're unfamiliar with this and you ever have a little time to kill, there is actually a Wikipedia page on Perl poetry, and if you Google for Perl poetry, you will find... Uh, some remarkable works. Perhaps the best known such is a poem called Black Pearl. This is a poem which is a complete Pearl program and it definitely reads like a poem. Um, beforehand, closed door, each window and exit, wait until time. My favorite bit actually is Kill Spiders. Pop them, chop, split, kill them. Unlink arms, shift, wait and listen. Listening, wait. Sort the flock, then warn the goats and kill the sheep. So I really enjoyed reacquainting myself with Pearl poetry that um, was something that I'd not looked at for about 15 years. But it really set me thinking. Obviously, we can write poems in Perl because Perl is an incredibly flexible language. I was thinking, do I know any other incredibly flexible languages? Then it occurred to me that Scala would be certainly the only strongly typed language that I can think of that you can write poetry in. So I decided that I'd have a crack at writing poetry in Scala. So, What's more, actually inspired uh, by Christopher Hunt from TypeSafe, I decided that the poem should actually summarize some of the themes of my presentation. So I'm now going to read you my Ode to Scala, which is written in Scala, and which summarizes some of the themes that I'll be talking about for the rest of the presentation. Now, I've had to allow myself a little leeway. Obviously, in Perl, your poem can be a complete Perl listing. In Scala, that's not really possible because 
you know, you do need to have some definitions in place um, to be able to use your poetry. So I'll leave as an interesting exercise um, for attendees to figure out exactly what stuff I haven't shown. But everything that I have here compiles and is literally, you know, part of the listing as it um, exists. However, one real advantage of writing poetry in a strongly typed language is that you can refactor your poetry. Now, this is just <laughs> awesome. I've written some poetry before, but I have never refactored poetry. So, Ode to Scala. I love her silken symmetry. Her supple form entices, oh yes, enraptures, entraps me. I love this, it's heaven, yet import pain. <laughs> Shit, why this synchronized torment? Heaven and hell. If, she says, your love is not enough, resist, resist, resist. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Be not obsessed. Relax, this map suffices. That way madness lies. I say, it is enough. Class warfare extends ghetto, filled with suffering. If easily angered, throw under the bus. <laughs> Object ridicule extends warfare. Ridicule hurts. Class unity extends community with joy 1,000 fold. Remember, the wheel is not a new idea with Scala. Remember and rejoice, print money. So as I said, this poem does summarize the key points of my presentation proper. My presentation is about where I see Scala being in five years' time. So where will Scala be in 2018? So here I have out my crystal ball. So, you know, this is very much statements of my opinion. We'll see in five years' time whether I'm right or wrong. I believe that in 2018, Scala will be the leading newer language. I believe it is currently breaking out of the pack um, of so-called second-tier languages, and it will be the biggest thing since Java. I do not believe that it will be as big as Java because I don't believe anything will ever be as big as Java again. We are in an era of increased language fragmentation. We're going to see greater specialization, and I think we're not going to see that idea that we had with Java that you know, absolutely everything should be solved using a particular language. And you know what? I think that's healthy. I think it actually, much as the fact um, you know, that obviously my career for the last 10 years has been pretty strongly identified with Java, but you know, frankly, even I, 10 years ago, used to feel bad about the fact that no matter what the problem was, People assume that you had to solve it in Java. However, having said that, Java is not going to go away anytime soon. How many people have seen Monty Python's The Holy Grail? Who recognizes this scene where at the time of plague, the guy is going around saying, bring out your dead, bring out your dead. And this person is brought out, and the only thing is he's saying, I'm not dead. I'm not dead yet. He says, of course, you soon will be. Java is a bit like this. I mean, Java's regularly pronounced dead. It's obviously deeply uncool, but for some reason, it just won't go away. For example, if you look at the data, this is the Tyobi Programming um, Language Popularity Survey. This is the um, last month's data. Java is pretty much always up there, roughly equal with C, as the number one language, and quite a lot ahead of number three. And typically, month to month, it's flat or even in modest growth. So, I mean, interestingly, according to the metrics that they track, in the last month 
over the previous month, the um, activity around Java grew by a fifth of the total activity in Ruby. So, you know, this is a language that um, is certainly not going to grow and certainly has peaked, but it's not going to go away. And it's still going to be a major part of the landscape for many years. You know what? I think this is good for us. This is something that we should be aware of, but I think it's fundamentally good for Scala. One of the reasons for that is if you look at the engine that's underneath Scala, that engine presently is the JVM. And the fact that Java is still alive and kicking actually is very positive for Scala. So in five years' time, who do I think will be using Scala? I think Scala will have found its niche as the leading enterprise language. Enterprise language I would define as being the traditional enterprise apps and also an emerging category of things like Twitter that are just incredibly difficult. They're not enterprise in the traditional definition, but they're really, really demanding. They need the best performance you can possibly get. They've got a scale. Um, you know, that is a very important category of what you might call new enterprise demands. So I think those are two areas where Scala is going to be very, very successful. But Scala is going to be part of a messy world. So, for example, I think you'll see situations where Scala is gradually introduced into projects that are um, previously Java. And, for example, where you see, say, Scala being introduced to add a DSL capability initially to um, an application that's predominantly written in Java. I don't think we're going to see millions of developers using Scala. I think the so-called corporate developer is not going to switch to Scala. So I don't see people, say, coming from a VB um, background moving to Scala. And also, although this may be a controversial opinion, I don't really see a lot of startups moving to embrace Scala. The reason for that is, amongst other things, that there is really an almost irrational hatred of the JVM in um, startup land. And although I would argue that being on the JVM is a wonderful choice for Scala, unfortunately, you know, there are many people who just will not go near the JVM for largely irrational reasons. Secondly, I guess the majority or whole of the people in this room are like me, people who like type safety. And there really is a pretty strong um, trend in the startup community towards um, dynamic typing. So, you know, I don't think Scala is a perfect fit for what um, those kind of developers like. However, I do think that in many cases they will end up encountering the Twitter scenario where ultimately Scala becomes a very, very attractive choice when the performance and scalability demands become such that, you know, for example, a popular dynamic languages really aren't adequate. I think with respect to web development, we will see the, um, you know, a lot of that migrate into JavaScript, so I don't think that will run on the JVM. So how will Scala get to this position of success? I think Scala will move towards the mainstream I would see it having embraced the Java ecosystem to a greater degree, choosing to fight only winnable battles, and also slowing down in terms of language innovation, becoming more predictable and easier for new adopters. At this point, you might think, is this like the village that had to be destroyed in order to save it? Is this like the conference? Does this mean that I'm advocating that Scala should have sold out? You know what? Sometimes I think that there can be merits in selling out. I love this uh, cartoon about a new Star Trek movie, which is getting reviews like comprehensible, not dorky, and good for normal people. And of course, the hardcore Trekkies are saying, ah, oh, it's going to suck. If you look at some successful 
sellouts. The Red Hot Chili Peppers used to be known as Tony Flo and the Miraculously Majestic Masters of Mayhem. Changing their name to something that was a little bit more potentially mainstream was probably, probably good on the whole. Um, the Grateful Dead used to be known as Mother McCree's Uptown Drug Champions. So, you know, sometimes selling out a little bit can be a good thing if you want to get a larger audience. So I have a confession to make. I am biased, but probably not how you think. Over the last year, the, pretty much the only code that I've written has been in Scala. And I love Scala. I love Scala uh, more than any language I've programmed in since C. Now C obviously didn't do the full range of things that we typically want in a modern language, but I always felt with C, everything it did, it did really, really well. And, you know, Scala is the first language that I've programmed in since C, where I have this feeling of profound elegance, that, you know, this is really nice, it's very well thought out, it hangs together. So, you know, I think that's a fantastic um, testament to the work of Martin and the others who've worked on Scala, that this, you know, is a really elegant and beautiful language. I can't see myself programming in Java again, and this is the reason that um, I chose to join the TypeSafe board, as well as the fact that obviously um, I have a very high regard for a number of the people um, at TypeSafe. So if you look at my background, it's pretty typical. I think for an adopter of Scala. I've got enterprise software experience and most recently a Java background before that C and C++. So, you know, I think some of the experiences that I've had getting to grips with Scala are probably fairly typical of the experiences that people are going to have adopting this technology. I have another confession to make, which is even though I made fun of it, I actually really like Star Trek, uh, particularly the first series. So even though I poke some fun at Star Trek, um, I'm actually very fond of it. So why is Scala awesome? Look, I'm preaching to the converted here, I'm sure, so I'm not going to go into details. You know, it's obviously a very concise language. Like, once you start programming in Scala, you really do um, notice just how verbose Java is. And, you know, Scala has this incredible combination of flexibility with retaining um, strong typing. And, you know, that just really works for me. That is, I've always been a fan um, of strong typing. And to have the ability to have strong typing with while ha also having a very flexible syntax, I just find very um, impressive. There's also obviously an elegant combination of object-oriented and functional capabilities. And in practice, I've seen the best experience, the best potential code reuse that I've ever seen while programming in Scala. So, you know, I'm also probably preaching to the converted in terms of why Java sucks. Um, like, particularly once you start programming in Scala, you realize, you know, just how much duplication there is in Java code. So, for example, you want to chain constructors, getters and setters, lack of default method arguments, which was always something that um, I missed from the C++ days. You know, immutability is possible, but doesn't feel natural or encouraged. And obviously, you have limitations in terms of code reuse that you can achieve. Um, using traits. So I was originally going to show some of these things with examples, but I think, you know, it's pretty obvious, so um, I don't think I need to do that with this audience. So I don't think any of this is controversial at all, but possibly the next couple of slides will be more controversial. Why is Java awesome? You know what? Java is pretty much equal number one programming language with C in the world. Is that an accident? You know, is Java very bad? Does Java suck massively? And this is a complete random accident. 
You know what? I don't think it is a complete random accident. And there are also some things that are very good about Java. And we should also consider them. So amongst those things are the fact that the JVM is robust and performant. So let me run through some of these things that are really good about Java and you know, the way in which Scala plays in that space. So with respect to the strength of the JVM, this is, this is fantastic because of the work that um, the Scala team have done. We, you know, we get all the benefits of the JVM in Scala. So yeah, that's great. Java has really pretty awesome tooling. Our tooling story is not as good yet, but it is clearly improving. And also, again, the fact that we're a strongly typed language means that we have potential to you know, have similar level of tooling um, to that which exists in Java. So I think with tooling, it's a question of time. We're clearly not there yet in terms of maturity or performance um, of the tool chain to be on a par with Java, but we're, we're going to get there. If you look at the Java community, I think one of the real strengths of the Java community is that it's a pretty pragmatic community that's focused on solving real world problems. This is something where, frankly, I don't think we compare quite so well. Um, we have a mix of folk in our community, and there do seem to be quite a few people who aren't highly focused on solving real world problems. And I think that is a bit of a um, problem overall for Scala. Start it again. Other reasons why Java is awesome. Great backward compatibility. Um, we have somewhat less than great backward compatibility. Just, just a little bit less. Uh, Java has some powerful libraries and frameworks. Here again, we have a mixed story. So it's actually very easy to consume those Java libraries, but there does seem to be a bit of a tendency towards wheel, wheel reinvention. So just ignoring things that may exist and actually be perfectly usable from Java land and rewrite those things in Scala. Java is a very restrictive language. Scala is a very flexible language. This is mostly good, but also somewhat dangerous, because it does mean that you need discipline in how you write Scala. Java has a culture of readable, if verbose code. We have a culture of unreadable, clever code. So the reason that I'm saying these things is I think that we should take some lessons from Java's popularity. You know, it's, it's really easy to take pot shots at Java and say that it sucks. But, you know, let's realize that it is no accident that it's been so popular and learn from some of the things that it does well as well as the things that it does badly. Secondly, to bear in mind that as Java is not going away, we really want to play nice with Java rather than just hope to completely replace it. This brings me to some myths that I believe that we need to combat um, to make Scala more widely adopted. First of these myths is that it's good to be clever. So here is um, a code sample which your mileage might vary, but to me this is not the most readable piece of code I've ever seen. And it's very difficult to figure out what's going on here without a lot of context. Obviously, one of the things is the use of operators and symbols, which, you know, frankly, I think in many, particularly in many libraries, tend to get overused. So it does create a scenario where it's really not obvious from a piece of code, even where you might go um, to look um, to find how those things fit together. So there's a whole bunch of things, like if you make extensive use of implicit conversions, implicit parameters, um, the ability to use the full Unicode char set and identifiers, renaming imports, even you know, excessive use of type inference, you can end up with code that's hard to read. 
Now, one of the common responses to this in the uh, Scala community is a mathematical proof, a rigorous mathematical proof that Scala is simpler than Java. I have to say that my opinion is that this simply is not so in practice. If you look at Java code, you tend to be able to read it. If you look at Scala code, you will encounter people who write code that is pretty much impossible to read. I would argue that's not good Scala code. I would argue that if you write good Scala code, it will be easier to read than Java code because it will be more elegant and less verbose. But there does have to be a degree of discipline. And we shouldn't prioritize cleverness as you know, a metric, valuable metric of code quality. Many of you may have heard the old joke about C giving you enough rope to hang yourself. So the joke went that if C gave you enough rope to hang yourself, C++ gave you enough rope to bind and gag your neighborhood, rig a small sailing ship, and then still hang yourself after that. <laughs> so we should reflect here on some of the merits of languages in which you can't write poetry. Nobody's ever going to write a poem in Java. But it is also hard to hang yourself. And I think we should reflect on the fact that Java's success was partly due to the fact that it was less powerful than C++. So, you know, where many teams were going around, um, you know, shooting both feet off using um, some of the really complex features of um, C++, Java actually provided essentially a subset of capabilities that worked pretty well for many teams. Actually, I would argue that in some ways Java 8 is going to be better for Scala than it is for Java. Um, because Java 8 validates some of the core concepts in Scala, obviously, by introducing some function capability into um, Java itself. It validates things that you know, Scala has done from its foundation. And on the other hand, I think it starts to make, or continues the trend of Java becoming increasingly complex, which I think um, is becoming problematic because that's starting to get out of Java's sweet spot. But having said that, we really don't want anything bad to happen for Java, so we should hope that Java 8 works out pretty well in practice. Further example of my point here about cleverness and obfuscation. How many people are familiar with the dispatch library? So it's um, essentially for uh, making web requests. It sits on top of Apache Commons HTTP client. This is the so-called dispatch periodic table. The dispatch API consists largely of bizarre cost custom operators. So somebody very kindly did the work to produce what's called, he called the dispatch periodic table to translate these operators into English. I hope you agree what the problem is here. A language like Scala allows you to express things in English. So why you would ever need to have a crib sheet to translate strange symbols into English baffles me because that does not seem to be the purpose of a high-level programming language um, to me. Actually, I have a personal experience about um, the dispatch library that um, underlines some of my points about Scala libraries. I started off thinking, well, I need to make some um, get requests. Obviously, I'll do it the Scala way. So I download dispatch. I get it working. It's not too hard to get it working. Uh, and then I upgrade my version of Scala, and everything breaks. So I figure out that the problem appears to be dispatch, and it doesn't yet seem to be a version of dispatch for the version of Scala that I now have. So I think, you know what, maybe I'll just get rid of dispatch and use HTTP client. I think I ended up with two extra lines of code, and I've never had to worry about my build ever again. So, you know, just a case in point where, as it turns out, essentially to me, all dispatch added over HTTP client was an arguably slightly more elegant, you know, two or three lines of code and a build problem. It's really not about lines of code. It's about readability. 
So here I'm going to start quoting from some, th some things from the Scala mailing lists. I'm not saying that these are representative. However, I am saying that some of these sentiments occur more often than they should. So this is a quote from someone in the mailing list. Java is much better suited for big teams because it's a stupid language that feels like you're coding with your hands bound. The more humans you add to a group, the more stupid each individual gets, even if they are all geniuses. So essentially, you know, you don't really need to worry about understandability. The problem is you're screwed as soon as you have a lot of people looking at any piece of code anyway, so don't even try. So now let's think about how some eminent computer scientists have approached this problem. Many people have made the point that um, on the first bullet, but I think Martin Fowler has expressed it particularly well. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers write code that humans can understand. There's, I think, an even better quote from Brian Kernighan, who is the creator of C. Debugging is twice as hard as writing the code in the first place. Therefore, if you write the code as cleverly as possible, you are, by definition, not smart enough to debug it. So to me, this underlines this need for um, Scala coding standards. And you know, in Scala, you can do the same thing in many ways. You can write poetry, but poetry may not be good code. You need to converge on one good way and make that you know, essentially the standard approach. This is actually something that I think the Rails community did really well for Ruby. And it helped Ruby take off as a language, because they actually tended to say, you know what, this is a really good way of doing it, so we're all going to do it this way. So I think that kind of consistency is very important for flexible languages. And I mean, I think to look again at the example of Perl, this is something that hasn't worked out that well in Perl, that you know, essentially people write Perl in so many different styles that it's not uncommon to see a single line of code um, that a substantial proportion of the Perl community would find hard to understand. So, you know, I think that there's definitely progress being made here, for example, in some of the guidance that Martin is providing, and I would encourage you, amongst other things, to read Martin's Levels um, document, because I think it's a very interesting suggestion of different subsets that are appropriate in different contexts. But, you know, I think there needs to be a strong emphasis on not making application developers do bizarre stuff. You know, there's things you might want to do in library development, but don't force those things on application developers. And you know, also, I would really like to see uh, a convergence on a strong set of coding standards. Another myth that seems to be fairly common in the Scala community is that ignorance should be punished. So again, some quotes from the mailing list. If your coworkers are idiots, that's really a problem with your coworkers. It's not a problem with me. If I write a piece of code and you can't understand it, that's your fault. There is no onus on me to write code that anyone else can read because they're just not smart enough. They can't read it. Really important point. Or alternatively, expressed a little bit more vividly. You even said avoid answering Scala questions with Haskell. Fuck you, Kevin. If I feel it is appropriate to answer with Haskell, I will do exactly that. I really don't care that you do not understand. <laughs> Again, I'm not saying this is typical. So for example, I should point out that Martin jumped into that thread and you know, made a very um, strong rebuttal of this kind of approach. But I am saying that you do get a bit more of this um, than you should. And I think here we should learn some lessons from other communities. Interesting lessons here from Groovy. I certainly wouldn't advocate Scala as a language learning from Groovy. I think you know, there is a pretty dramatic difference in terms of the elegance and um, rigor of Scala versus Groovy. But in terms of the community, they certainly have some things right. 
So, for example, if people come into the Groovy community and essentially write code that looks like Java, they're cool with that. You know, they understand that if someone comes into Groovy, they're not going to stay writing Java forever. They're going to realize that now they're in a language that can do certain things more elegantly. And over time, they will grow their knowledge of Groovy and they'll write better, more idiomatic Groovy code. Whereas, for example, if you start writing um, you know, Scala code that looks very much like Java, you will certainly find plenty of people in the community who will criticize you um, fairly robustly. Another um, lesson in this regard, I think, comes from the Spring community. One of the things that we got right was a culture of respect in the forums. And it really, Karma works amazingly well. Respect breeds respect. Like if, um, you know, there is a welcoming hand extended, even to people who, you know, obviously don't understand a lot when they first join a community. Over time, those people will quite often be willing to pay back the help they had and help, um, you know, people who come in after them. Some important facts to remember here. Most of those who will be using Scala in 2018 are not using it today. So it's interesting when you see something that's growing rapidly, like Scala is today, you realize that you know, this audience is going to be a very small minority um, over time. So we really need to think not only of the kind of skills and background that we in this room and in the present Scala community have, but of the kind of backgrounds that people are going to come in with. Where are they going to come from? They will come from languages that look very much like Java. Why can I say this with some degree of confidence? Because I think five out of the top six languages are pretty similar to Java. And even if you consider the Java community alone, it is over 50 times larger than the Haskell community. So these people are going to come from object-oriented languages that are very like Java. So I think we really need to think about how do we welcome them. What do they need to be productive and adopt Scala incrementally? It's unrealistic for a working developer to jump into a new language, instantly become an expert, and instantly adopt that new language everywhere. It just doesn't happen like that. So how can we enable these developers to come on board, learn as they go, be productive from day one, and gradually you know, move towards a more idiomatically Scala way of doing it? And how can we make them have fun while they do it? How can we ensure that this isn't a humiliating process, but that it's a fun process? Another myth that seems to be popular in the community is that object-oriented programming is bad. Personally, I believe, and I think Martin is quite clear on this, that Scala is an elegant blend of object-oriented and functional programming. It's for people who want to do both. And if people don't like object-oriented programming and think it has no value, I don't think it's really an argument on evidence. I mean, I think personally there's plenty of evidence that object-oriented modeling has value. But, you know, frankly, if you don't like object orientation, Scala is not the language for you. Languages exist that are the correct language if you want to write purely functional code. And they are not Scala. Another myth that is... Oh, let's start again. Sorry about this. Another myth that seems to be quite prevalent is that this language is so good we don't need no lousy frameworks. Remember how the, in dreadful languages like Java they used to have infrastructure? We don't need that because our language is so good. In reality, it's not just about the language. Much, indeed arguably most, real world programming has very little to do with elegant expression of algorithms. It has to do with interacting with the fact that the real world is a total mess. Like wherever you look, if you look at databases, if you look at transaction management, if you look at legacy systems, network calls, it's a nasty mess out there. And a great deal of the code that we write is far more to do with navigating that nasty mess than it is elegantly expressing algorithms. So to me, the idea that you don't need frameworks in uh, Scala is a bit like saying 
you know what? We've got a really fast car. So what are we going to do with the time we save? We're going to build our own road. So it turns out that if you have a fast car like a 911, you benefit a lot from the infrastructure that people have already developed for it. So if you have a 911 and a road, you know, it's a good combination. You can have a really, really good time. A better time than if you have to build the road first. Related to this is myth number five, that because Java sucks, Java coders are simply not as smart as us, so any viewpoint or piece of code that comes out of Java land, yeah, wouldn't want to go near that. That's clearly going to be dumb. This is a fairly typical point, I think, that you see in a young community. Young communities tend to be arrogant. And that's actually, for a while, that's really quite valuable. Because when you come along with a, in a young community, it's all very exciting. You kind of want to figure out which parts of the world can you change and which can't you change. And eventually you realize there are some things that you can radically improve and sweep away. And there are other things that you can't. And you know, I think the point has come now where we should be realistic about this. Exhibit A, for me in this regard, is Scala object relational mapping. So, Scala object relational mapping in theory. This is a post from the mailing list. So I'll, I'll summarize it because you probably can't read it at the back. So this is saying that you know, we really need Scala ORM solutions because we can say here are the hundreds of lines of code you need to work with a database. You need classes for object relational mapping, dozens of annotations, dozens of lines for simple type shapes queries. You need to know the quirks of Hibernate, JPA, Eclipse Link, and you probably still need to write SQL. So what we need to be able to show, this poster says, is here is how you do that in Scala, in a single line of code. And he says that, I think if we would have this, we will more or less have the whole enterprise stuff, one. So obviously this poster is one of the more naive members of the community. However, you know, it's a reductio ad absurdum essentially of the argument that because we've got a great language, problems that other people in Java or C Sharp or Ruby or whatever have wrestled with, problems that have been complex, they're going to be trivial for us. We can do it in a single line of code. To which, you know, the answer is if you've ever written an OR mapping tool, you can't do it in a single line of code. And the reason, as I said, is because that you're dealing, you're dealing with a very murky real world. You know what? Databases suck. Not only is there the object relational impedance mismatch that we've all heard about, but it's even worse. If you look at the capabilities of different databases, you look at the variance in SQL, you look at some of the additional capabilities, you look at even things that should be trivial, like primary key generation. It's a very nasty, messy world. And the actual programming language we use is only a very small part of the solution. So to continue exhibit A, Scala object relational mapping in practice. I have to say, I do not think this is one of the areas in which Scala has been most gloriously successful. In fact, I think it's relatively difficult to make um, Scala code compare badly with the Java equivalent, but most of the Scala persistent solutions do just that. So you often take code and relationships if you're working with a relational database that actually really look pretty simple and understandable using um, JPA. And you look at some of the Scala libraries and you think essentially what the, like, I mean, this is a very, very simple example um, using um, from, I think, the enorm lists. And, you know, I mean, it's not terrible, but frankly, I don't think this is nearly as understandable is doing the same thing with Java and JPA. Or, you know, potentially Scala and JPA. And essentially, it's also exhibiting um, a tendency to do things in the Scala collections library that ultimately do become problematic when you do things like out of joins. So this is also reflecting an approach that may seem more idiomatically Scala, but potentially is going to have a performance overhead. 
So, you know, I think we should look at the Java solutions before we implement new capabilities in Scala. I think we should embrace the Java ecosystem because it is an enormous benefit to us. We shouldn't view it as an embarrassment. We shouldn't view Java as, you know, the um, idiot country cousin. Um, we should be really glad that whereas to, say, embrace Haskell or Ruby, um, if you're an enterprise, you'd have to throw away your investment in the JVM and the things that you've used or built around that, you know, we can get that benefit um, very easily in the Scala world. I would suggest that, you know, there should be a checklist before writing any new Scala framework. And the first question should be, does it already exist in Java? The second question is, can we make it idiomatic Scala? So, for example, can we use some of those wonderful, cool things that exist in Scala, like implicit conversions, to actually make this really idiomatic to use in Scala? If the answer is we, that we can do that, we are going to end up with something that's much better to use in Scala than it ever was in Java. And it's also quite likely robust and proven as a solution in terms to the underlying practical problem. If we discover that we cannot make this thing usable in an idiomatic way in Scala, that's a trickier question. And even then, I think we have to ask the question of how realistic is it to solve this problem um, you know, in the um, near term versus just accept that perhaps if we address this particular concern, it may be a little bit messy in our code. But, you know, I think we need to put the bar a lot higher. I mean, frankly, there is some great stuff out there in Scala libraries, but there's also a lot of junk. I mean, the amount of junk is, the proportion of junk is definitely higher than it is in Java land. You know, where essentially people are writing solutions that address practical concerns that are, you know, frankly about like where Java was 10 years ago in addressing that particular problem. Another problematic myth is that purity matters. Another quote from the mailing list, which essentially says, you know what, if many people disagree, they're probably all wrong. There are times when it's really important to sweep aside conventional wisdom. But you want to be really, really sure. And it may well be that the reason that many people are doing something a certain way actually has some practical experience behind it. And it may well be that in certain cases you want to compromise on you know, your intellectual purity in terms of getting real world work done. So I think you know, one of the motivations for some of the Scala approaches to persistence is to get type safety. So, for example, I've seen many times expressed, you know, absolute horror at the thought of something like JPQL or HQL because it's not type safe. As I said, I'm a big fan of strong typing. But frankly, I have never had a significant problem using JPA or Hibernate that related to errors in my uh, query strings. Those problems were typically found very, very quickly. They did not account for a lot of wasted time. So, you know, I think a lot of pretty unnatural things are done in some areas to ensure that, you know, absolute type safety survives everywhere, when in fact, you know, this is a particular case where if you've got the type safety hammer, OR mapping may actually not be a nail. OR mapping might end up being your finger. So, you know, I think that we need to accept that when we get into an inherently messy real world, intellectual purity can be quite dangerous. Another myth is that it's all about new language features. A mainstream language cannot progress like the wind. So if Scala is to become a truly mainstream language, it really is going to have to move more slowly. Why? Well, I think one of the fundamental reasons is backward compatibility. 
particularly if my um, thesis is correct and Scala is going to succeed as an enterprise language, the enterprise needs predictability. You know, maybe we do have to sell out a bit. Maybe we have to become a bit more boring. I think we also should honestly ask the question, does anyone really stick with Java because they don't think there's enough new stuff in Scala? Is anyone going to say, oh, no, that Scala thing, like if they had another five um, new features over Java, then I might look at it? I don't think so. You know, I think in terms of the capabilities of the language, it's pretty impressive. I think the only thing that does need to go faster is the compiler. Compared to Java, the compiler is slow and buggy. And remember, as I'm saying, people are likely to come into this language predominantly from Java, and they're going to make the comparison. Right, there is no way the Scala compiler is going to be as fast as Java. It does have a lot more work to do. But it certainly can be faster than it is now, and it can be more robust. And for that to happen, I think the pace of language innovation needs to slow down. I think we also need to ask the question, not only do, you know, does anyone really demand more features in order to be interested in Scala, but I think we need to ask the question of whether the language being a moving target actually puts off adopters. So, for example, you know, there's a lot to learn if you come from, say, Java or C Sharp and go to Scala. And if that actually changes every six months, um, that's a bit scary. So my two cents on language innovation, this is an Australian two cent coin, by the way, um, is that I don't think new language features like macros are the highest priority. I really think that in time we're going to have to have multiple language profiles. So, you know, an academic experimental tool that will drive the future, and a subset of Scala for working developers that really has an emphasis on stability and a small footprint. And I think we should be paranoid about footprint partly in terms of making it easy for people to come to Scala. So in conclusion, I think we are at a critical moment. I think Scala has a great chance of being the next big enterprise language. So I've said, I think it's less likely to appeal to startups, but in the traditional enterprise and the new kind of Twitter-like extreme scale, I think Scala is very, very compelling. And I think that what happens next is largely up to the Scala community. I think we need to decide as a community what will Scala be when it grows up. Do we actually want it to be mainstream? I think that we actually need to see at this point more evolution in the community than in the language itself for Scala to become mainstream. I think the community needs to be more pragmatic more focused on real world problems and you know, more accepting that every wheel in sight shouldn't be reinvented. And it needs to be more welcoming of new adopters. So what if when they adopt they're very naive and unsophisticated in their knowledge of Scala? Isn't it great that they're using Scala? Because over time they will learn. I think there's a very strong need for coding standards. Nothing out there that I've seen um, you know, to me goes as far as we need in terms of really unifying um, the community on a set of standards. And I think that developers need to actually follow standards. There is definitely a danger that if you have a language you can write poetry in, you'll write poetry. But sadly, the vast majority of us are not paid to write poetry. Even very few poets are paid to write poetry. So 
we are paid to solve real problems. And a degree of discipline in the kind of code that we write in Scala is really, really important. I think we need to embrace the Java ecosystem and even to some extent Java itself. We are essentially in practice bound into this ecosystem. It has some incredible strengths like the JVM and also the very wide adoption of Java. You know, let's, let's accept that, make sure that it can make us more effective um, and you know, enjoy the fact that it can potentially make us more widely adopted. We need to stop reinventing wheels. You know, we need to be very selective in terms of which battles we fight. There are some things, for example, where you can write a Scala library that's simply going to be way better than any Java library can ever be. But there are also problems like OR mapping where the complexity is nothing to do with the language. I mean, the complexity is the fact that um, this is a nasty, complex, messy um, integration problem um, rather than a language problem. I think Scala language innovation needs to slow down. The good news is, I think, that the journey has already begun in many of these areas. So, for example, around tooling and the compiler and backward compatibility, you know, I think the Scala team are very well aware um, of these issues and they're now starting to find real solutions to them. So, you know, I think the solutions are in sight for uh, some of these challenges, but you know, I'm talking about uh, where things stand right now. So I think the journey has already begun, and I'll conclude um, with the conclusion of my uh, poem, which, as you can see, benefits from our potential to use Unicode characters. Um, you can try to work out what that actually is. Um, welcome, new era with boundless potential. Thread sleep sweetly enough. Thank you.